Welcome into the Ots and Audibles podcast. It is a Wednesday when you're listening to this show. Matt Preem had some conflicts. We brought in the superior sidekick for this show, Brandon Huffman, recruiting analyst for 24-7 Sports. Huff, how are we doing? I know you've been on the road. Yeah, we are, we're doing good. October is coming to an end. Uh, we're in November, and I don't think I have to go on the road till like, uh, you know, signing day. And then pretty much I spent all of January through July on the road again. So it was nice to get back on the road, get out to some schools, covered a lot of mileage, and uh, I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted. Well, bring as much as you've got. Whatever energy you have left, let's exert it here. We've got 20 minutes or so with you. Well, you know what they say. It uh -oh. is, uh, you're not you when you're, not, when you're hungry. But <laughs> So I'm just kidding. Oh, great. No, I fumbled the bag. <laughs> Free advertisement for Snickers. You need an NIL deal. Um, mm -hmm. We're now about 48 hours removed from a crown jewel commitment for Oregon's 2024 class. Elijah Rushing, edge player. When to start here, just get your thoughts. Um, I know he's not in your area. I'm not sure if you've actually seen him in person all that recently, but what do you like about him? What do you think this does for Oregon's class? I mean, you can never have enough quality defensive linemen. And now Oregon's got the two most quality defensive linemen from the West Coast and two of the top quality defensive linemen nationally uh, in a region that doesn't necessarily produce a lot of defensive linemen. They've got the two best, and they're still in the mix for a third one. So adding Elijah Rushing to the mix, uh, I remember the first time I saw him was in the spring of his freshman year down in Arizona at the uh, ESPN Under Armour camp. And even then, you could see that this kid had the makings of something special. He had the length. He had, uh, you know, the, the twitch, the, the quickness off the ball. And all he's gotten over the last two years is bigger and stronger. And, again, you can't have enough quality defensive linemen. But when you now bring in a guy like an Aiden Breland to play on the inside, and then you add a pass rusher like Elijah Rushing, you know, that is a hell of a one-two combo. That's what you see – Schools like Georgia, schools like Alabama kind of bringing in. Uh, yeah, they're bringing them in on a yearly consistent basis, and it seems like Oregon has made that such a focal point since the hiring of Dan Lanning to not just mix it up uh, on the interior but on the, the outside pass rush as well, and they're getting one of the very best pass rushers in the country in Elijah Rushing. I want to ask your thoughts now on the combination. You kind of mentioned that one-two punch with Breland and Rushing. Obviously, defense is more complicated than that. There's more pieces to it, but just – this feels special. This is, I know, the first time Oregon's ever had two defensive linemen that are five stars in, in one cycle. Um, what, what is Oregon getting with those two players? And then we'll, in a second, I'll ask you big picture with this class defensively because there are, it's not just those two. There are some real heavy hitters uh, this cycle, especially defensively for Oregon. Yeah, I mean, with Breland, you're getting a guy who's just a you know a, a load in the middle of the field, you know, but but not a guy who's just going to be taking up space. This is a guy that can get into the backfield and get to the quarterback and end the run really quickly after the handoff. He's a guy that's got some quickness up front. He can play, you know, D tackle. He can be a three tech. Uh, I don't know that he ever grows into like a true nose type size, but he's a he's a big guy who reminds me a little bit of Kenny Clark, who played mm. at UCLA, another Southern California prospect, uh, who's been a really good pass rusher just by playing on the interior. Uh, but Breland, you can kind of move him around uh, along the defensive line. Whereas Elijah Rushing, I think he, you know, worst case scenario, he ends up growing into a three tech, but he's going to be such a weapon as a pass rusher. And I think when you, you look at what they've landed at the defensive line position in the last couple of classes, these aren't two guys that you're going to come in. You're like, they're going to start right away because there's going to be some talent for them to overcome. But now you start looking at that rotation. Now you start looking at the depth that they have at those positions. And if you look around the Pac-12, and if you look around college football, there's only a handful of schools that have a solid defensive line rotation where you can bring in uh, almost a hockey line change and not have a drop-off. These guys are talented enough where they're going to be right there with those older guys that have had a year or two more in the weight room, but they're not going to be expecting a, a, a it's not going to be a big jump for them going from high school to college. And I think both have college ready bodies that they're only going to get bigger and stronger and you know bigger in a good way, uh, quicker, a little twitchier. But uh, again, in high school, most guys get away with their technique being somewhat poor, not saying that rushing and Breland have poor technique. It's just, you only need one or two moves in high school. You get to college, you're going to need a battery of moves. So as they complete, they both continue to improve on their technique. You look at their size, their quickness off the ball. It's going to be a pretty fun marriage to watch. And do you think those two, because I'm curious, I, I think we've all been surprised watching Oregon this year, the way that not just Mateo, I think we expected immediate contributions, but Blake Purchase and Tatum Tuioti 
have played 20 snaps per game probably most of the, at least in conference play they've really come along do you look at rushing and Breland and and it, we should know Oregon's losing a lot in its front seven this 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 year in terms of graduation do you think those are guys that could make kind of close to immediate impacts I know you said don't expect starting I think that's a lot to ask for true freshmen almost regardless of position but do you look at those guys as kind of ready to contribute or are you thinking those are kind of a couple of years down the line what's your sense on there no, I, I think both, especially in the day and age that we're in of college football with the transfer portal, if you're not playing your talented true freshman early, they're going to leave. So they're going to be guys that are going to find a way on the rotation just from a talent standpoint alone. And then as they continue to, to develop, I think that you know kind of dictates how many snaps a game they're going to take. Um, both are better physical prospects than Blake Purchase and Tim Tuioti were in terms of what their, their NFL upside looks like, what their NFL body looks like. But what I think made Tuoti and Blake Purchase so invaluable as true freshmen is what has made them is that both played at a high level of football in mm. high school and were the best players on their team, were the best players on their, you know, in, in their programs, were the best players in their states. Tatum was the state, uh, you know, the, the number one prospect in the state. Blake Purchase was the top two. You know, Aiden Breland is probably has the most upside of anybody on that modern day team, but I'm not even sure he's the best defensive lineman at modern day right now. And you have a guy like Nasir White. Now, again, with the rankings, it's a projection. It's a four years from now NFL draftability, but you know, you got to go through three or four really good defensive players on the modern day team to even say that Breland is the best defensive player. Whereas rushing a very talented player, Obviously, he's got Keona Wilhite, his teammate, who's headed to the Northwest as well. Uh, he, too, flipped his commitment from Arizona to the University of Washington. Uh, you know, rushing is the top prospect in the state, the top defensive recruit. Uh, but uh, both guys, I think, are guys that are really going to take their game to the next level. But in terms of the expectation from them, when you know, when they were in high school, Tatum Tuioti, I mean, as he went, Sheldon went. And when he was playing with the club on his hand, by the time they got to the state championship, Wes Lynn had figured out a way to stop him after he dominated him. Blake Purchase, you know, a phenomenal player at a state powerhouse. Both those guys, you know, were the kind of guys that their motors alone weren't going to mm -hmm. keep them off the field. So now you throw Rushing and Breland who have more uh, projectable traits and, and size, and that should get them on the field quicker. But whether they have that, you know, that impact – it's going to it's going to really be dictated on how they make that transition to college. Mentioned it a moment ago, but it's not just those two guys in 2024 for Oregon defensively. You've got a bunch of the top prospects out west across the country. Braden Platt, a player you, I know you're very familiar with. Dakota Fields, a, a big time corner, one of the best corners out west. Certainly Aaron Flowers, um, Ife Abedegwe, um from from the other side of the country, Kamar Mathudi. I'm just scrolling down here. You get more names the further you go down here. The totality of this, and you can kind of start seeing it now watching Oregon this year now that they've kind of hit their stride. How excited should Oregon fans be about what this class could do for its defense, not just in 24, but down the line? Because it seems like they're really putting together now, stacking a couple of classes with just a lot of really high-end defensive players. Well, if you look at the two teams that have been the best in the Big Ten over the last eight 10 years consistently it's been Ohio State and Michigan and what's the recipe for their success well for Ohio State it's been phenomenal quarterback play and receiver play but this is a program that over the last decade had Nick Bosa and Joey Bosa and Chase Young mm -hmm. and uh uh goodness I'm, I'm blanking on the the pass rusher they had last year um the the basketball player I'm Blake it on his name, but they've okay. had, uh, you know, now they have JT Tumolo out, Jack Sawyer. You look at Michigan with an Aiden Hutchinson, with, with some of the guys they've had in the trenches. And the teams that have been winning the Big Ten over the last decade have consistently been the Ohio State, the Michigans, the Wisconsins. You've got to have a front seven that's going to be able to bring the heat. And if you just have even adequate quarterback play, which let's be honest, I mean, Michigan in, in their recent run up until this year, where it seems like G.J. McCarthy is one of the better quarterbacks in college football. It was sure. just go out there and don't screw it up. The year before that it was Kid McMurray. Just go out there and don't screw it up. We're going to run the ball. We're going to win with our, with our guys up front. Ohio state had the bonus of those years with the CJ Stroud and Justin Fields where they had elite passing game, but they still had an elite pass rusher. So I think when you look at what Oregon is doing is that they're building this team and they've been building this team to be a national program. They're not content with just being a Pac-12 competitor, which they've been the last two years. Now it's about competing for national championships. Obviously, when Dan Landon took the job, there was no idea that this would end up being a Big Ten program. But he knew being in Georgia that the architecture 
to be a national competitor was in your front seven, especially on the defensive line. And he's followed through with that since he's been at Oregon. So I think that this is the kind of offense that is going to win you some games. And we'll see how, you know, who replaces Bo Nix next year. But it's a defense that could potentially win you championships. And that's what you need to have to compete, I think, at a top five to top ten level each and every year rather than being just kind of a one year flash in the pan, which we, you know, maybe we saw with TCU last year, they had the offense, but they didn't have the defense when it got to the national championship game. And it took Georgia a couple of years to get to that point, but now they're winning on both sides of the ball. You've been on the road a lot. You've been seeing numerous prospects, numerous commitments for Oregon, obviously seeing a lot of prospects and commitments for other schools, but this is an Oregon podcast. So we'll focus on these guys. I wanted to start with, with Jericho Johnson, who I know you said you saw this past week. Another, you mentioned it earlier, Oregon has the top two defensive linemen now out west. Johnson is the third. Where do things stand, that stand there? And, and do you think there's a, a decent chance Oregon goes kind of clean sweep with the top three guys? I mean, I like where they're sitting with Jericho right now. He's already taken two official visits, took one to Washington back in the spring, and then he took an unofficial to Seattle for the Washington-Oregon game. But this past weekend, he was in Salt Lake City on an official visit. And what an impression that Oregon must have made with him uh, or made on him when he was in Salt Lake City to watch the Utes and then saw a thorough, dominant effort from Oregon. He's back on the road this week and he goes to USC for his third official visit. He hasn't said his Oregon official yet, but it's likely going to come in December. Uh, more likely than not, the weekend after the Pac-12 championship game, which I think would be what the first week, uh, in the first full weekend in December. Uh, in December, um, and this is a recruitment that I anticipate will go all the way till the early signing period, kind of that week. Uh, but I like where Oregon is sitting with him right now. Haven't gone fully in yet to put in a crystal ball for him, but I do like where the Ducks are sitting for him, and it wouldn't be a shock at all if they did the pull of the clean sweep. Let's do a little player eval here because I, I think he's different than Breland. He's different than rushing, obviously. Totally different body types there. What kind of a player? Because you mentioned earlier, you don't know if Breland ever becomes a full-fledged nose tackle. I look at Johnson, and maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong. I think there's a possibility that's where he ends up being most productive. I, I think not only does, is that where I think he ends up most productive, I think that's just where he ends up, period. You know, Being at a school last week, He's about 345, 350 right now. Uh, he played his junior year at about 320, 330. And, you know, he had some offseason injuries that he was dealing with. So kind of limiting what he could do. So he's put on the weight. But I think even if he plays at about a 330, 335, he's going to be a true nose. And he's got the strength. He's got the upper body where he's going to be able to take on numerous blockers and free up space for the guys in lined up next to him and outside of him. Uh, but I do think that he ultimately ends up, you know, straight up there with a the center and a guard playing at the next level, given his size, given, you know, how big he is. And it's not just that he's heavy, you know, he's not, it's not a fat heavy. It's a big, he is a big guy. He's legitimately six, three and a half, six, four, and he carries it pretty well, but he's a guy that's going to take up a lot of space and going to have to be the focus of a lot of interior linemen and blocking him, which again, frees up what the guys around him should be able to do. You also were able to see some commits. We'll start. I want to start with Kingston Lopa because I don't even know if we've really talked about him on our podcast, and I feel like that's a mistake. I went and watched his his junior film, and he has some of the most bone crushing hits I've seen in a minute. Six five one ninety. He's listed. We haven't listed as a linebacker. I know talking with you, you're you're kind of thinking he could move around a little bit, play a couple different spots. What did you learn about Kingston down there, and what what is Oregon getting here? Well, they're getting a guy who I, I think is just scratching the surface of how good he can be. What, what's intriguing about him is. When I saw him when he was a sophomore, he was probably 6'4", 185. And you looked at the length, you looked at the frame, and you thought, this guy's going to end up being an outside linebacker. He's going to get to 225, 230 easily, and he's going to be an athletic outside linebacker. Then I went back and saw him at Grant High School in the spring. He had a great junior year, helped him win a state championship. And he was about 185, 190. I'm like, okay, maybe he's not going to be an outside linebacker. Even when I was at the school last week, he's about 190, 195, and he's perfectly content being a big safety. If I'm going to go uh, kind of a, a player comp, I would say uh, Isaiah Polamau, who played at USC uh, a couple years ago out of Arizona, just that long, lanky safety type where he's probably best suited to play safety because he can cover. He can go sideline to sideline, but he's going to be able to come up in the box and, and be in situations where he's going to be able to deliver a blow, as you said, on his huddle. I mean, that's all he's doing on that is delivering the blow. I don't know if he ever gets bigger than 205, you know, 210 tops, but you have an athletic big guy playing your deep center field for you. That's a big bonus to have. And I think with, with him, you know, we've gone away from trying to project him as being at 225 and just thinking, man, he's athletic for being 6'4", 
200, 195 ish. And I, I think another guy, a little bit overshadowed. He keeps a low profile on social media. Remember, he was an Arizona commit at one point. And, you know, things are kind of quiet there once he committed to Arizona. Then he opened it up. Uh, I believe it was Arizona, or I'm sorry, it was Oregon, Washington, and Tennessee was starting to make a late push for him as well. But came up on his official visit to Oregon, Father's Day weekend, committed on the visit. Um, Huge, you know, great relationship with Tosh Lapoy. His head coach, Sid Quan Thompson at Sacramento Grant, uh, played with Tosh and, and for Tosh mm -hmm. at Cal. Tosh was key in recruiting Sid Quan's older brother, Shaq Thompson, to Washington back in 2012. So there was a familiarity there with Kingston and Tosh. And that's, I think, what really pulled uh, Oregon ahead of everybody else. And I think that they're getting – it's hard to call a guy who's a top 247 and a four-star uh, a steal, but I think that that's, it, it's applicable for Kingston Lopa. It's funny hearing Sid Kwan and Shaq Thompson's name in the recruitments because I remember following those when I was like, I think I was either just out of college or, or finishing it up. And yeah, it's wild thinking about that those was, guys. One was of my first ago. recruiting classes was, was Sid Kwan Thompson, 2003, 2004. And, you know, I, I'm already doing interviews with second generation recruits that I've covered. So every time I hear these names, it's just like another reminder that I'm getting ancient. <laughs> uh, let's. I want to spend a second here just on a couple other offensive line commits that you saw from Oregon. Kind of, I, I call Fox Crater in state. I know technically he's in your state up in Washington, but Devin Brooks, you saw him at Clackamas, Fox Crater right over the edge uh, of the state line there in Vancouver. What do you make about those two? What should Oregon know about them? Again, I think these are guys we talked about probably more than Lopa, but. Um, where do you see them, I guess, projecting at the next level? Yeah, I think Devin's going to end up being a center for Oregon. He could be a guard, but you know, he as he continues to get a little bit bigger, it's funny because he's always been uh, not on the slider side, but he's never been really big. And I think he's just not even close to what his physical piece is going to be when he gets to Oregon. But I think with his length, he's probably best suited to slide inside. He's been playing left tackle for Clackamas, but he knows he's going to probably be a center, potentially a guard. And he's actually been very open to being a to playing center and snapping the ball. Um, but he's going to be an athletic tackle making that move to center. So if he can get the snapping down, and, and it's always easier said than done. And I've been a part of the All-American Bowl in San Antonio for years, and for years, they would just bring linemen down, bring the best five best offensive linemen, and then they'd have to figure out, wait, does anybody know how to snap? And as more and more of these teams in games go shotgun base, these snaps would be going over to the head or to the left or to the right. So they finally bring, were bringing in pure center. So it's not always an easy transition, but Devin at a number of the camps he went to this year doing five on five, he worked out as a center where he was snapping the ball and then learning to block no, I'm sorry, learning to snap, then transition to blocking, which you already knew how to do. Uh, but I, I think that's where he plays. This is the third year in a row I went and saw Fox play. In the first two years, you could see the, the blank canvas that he was. You could see the tools, but you didn't see the player yet. And now as a senior, unfortunately, his season came to an end in uh, one of those weird WIAA tiebreaker games on mm -hmm. Monday night uh, where I think they played you know, a half or a quarter uh, and lost to Kelso. Uh, gosh, in a very narrow game. So Kelso moves on to the to the district playoffs. Uh, Fox's high school career came to an end, but this is a guy that I, I've been saying for a couple of years now, I think his best football is going to be played in college. And he's already made a huge jump from sophomore to junior and then junior to senior year. He looks nasty. He looks physical. Sometimes he admires his kill a little too much where it's like, hey, man, you know, I, I know you just depleted that guy. Now go take out a linebacker. Uh, <laughs> but that nasty streak that he's developed has been great. He's a basketball player, too. That's why he's not enrolling early. He's going right from football into basketball season. He's got good big man feet, good basketball basketball feet and that was kind of his first love so he's a kid that uh, another one like Devin he's just going to you know add weight when he gets to college and play at a pretty strong you know 310 ish and a guy that I, watching his development from his sophomore year to now his senior year uh is a guy that I think he's you know the upside's off the charts there one last 2024 prospect I wanted to mention I, and I kind of forgot I was going to ask him about after Jericho is, is Jason Brown who mm -hmm. I know is right up in your backyard there Running back, four star, one of the top kids in Washington. Where is his recruitment down? I know, I know there was a moment there where it felt like it was Michigan State, but with recent things that have happened there, it seems like it's kind of opened the door. Oregon has some momentum, at least with the crystal ball. Where, where are you kind of feeling things with Jason? Yeah, you know, it's funny. He was set to take a visit to Michigan State uh, the third weekend of the season, and it was on the Saturday night of the second week of the season that everything fell apart in East Lansing. And so he ended up canceling that visit and didn't make his first game visit outside of Seattle uh, until Oregon hosted Colorado 
I want to say that would have been what week four, week five ish. Um, yeah. And that was kind of the, the swing weekend for the Ducks uh, with Jason Brown. So coming off the hills of a lot of buzz, he was leaning towards Michigan State. He was going to head out there for his unofficial visit. Uh, everything falls apart. Then he gets his Oregon, and the buzz started to, to, to build from that visit. And I think with, with Jason Brown, it, it's probably a matter of sooner rather than later. I still like where the Ducks sit uh, for Jason Brown. He was in Seattle a couple weeks ago when the Huskies and, and Ducks played in his backyard. But – you know, this is a guy that, other than a couple of UW games, the only time he's ever gone to a college football game outside of the state of Washington was when he was down in Eugene in September. And I think the Ducks made a huge impact on him that weekend. Uh, it, it's clear that they featured the run, that they want to run the ball. And the, a lot of weapons touch the ball in that offense. So, you know, I don't think that Oregon's going to be set with just getting Jason Brown, if they do ultimately land him, I think they're going to keep trying for guys like Nate Frazier and you know some of the other backs that are out there. But if your worst case scenario is getting the top back in the Northwest, a guy who's been phenomenal this year, he's averaging something like 17 to 18 yards a carry. Uh, he's getting you know these eight, nine carry games where he's rushing for 200 yards. He looks the best he's ever looked in high school. He played his, his junior year at about 209. Just didn't look athletic, didn't look, you know, he put on a little too much weight trying to fill that feature or power back role. And he shed about 18 pounds this offseason and just looks so much more dynamic as a senior. And much like the freshman Jason Brown, where he really burst onto the scene. I'm going to ask you to wrap up kind of some of the recruiting talk because you did actually kind of a preview to what we're talking about to wrap the show. You were at USC Cal last weekend. So you're going to give us a little bit of a preview there of what you saw. But I, I wanted to finish with putting a couple of uh, in state. Uh, young players, players that are down the road here onto the radar of listeners. Um, Ansu Sano out of Lake Ridge, 2026. This is a kid with offers from, from Georgia and Miami already. Josiah Molden, yes, you probably recognize that name, a 2027 prospect who I know speaking with you and having seen him in person, got some special traits there. What did you, I know you said you saw, I think both of those guys in the last month or so, um, where do, what, what kind of, what do we need to know about those two guys? I don't even know if we need to get into the recruitments because we're, we're a couple of years away, but what, what do those guys possess physically that make them intriguing players? Yeah, you know, it's funny with Ansu, I had him rated as an athlete. You know, I always thought his body was going to make him a tight end or an H back or a linebacker. But after watching him play running back, after going to see him again in person, he hasn't really gotten much taller. I thought he was going to end up being this 6'4, you know, 225 pounder. He's probably about 6'1 and a half, maybe 6'2, um, and about 205, 210. But he runs with some juice to him. And you look at the, the big power backs you see in college football, and physically, he's very similar to them. Um, catches the ball extremely well. Well, he can run around you. He can run through you. And I'm starting to think he's going to end up being a running back, provided he doesn't have just some massive growth spurt. When you look at Josiah Molden, I mean, it is so rare to see a corner so technically sound at such a young age. And when you look at him, I mean, you, you see a kid that looks like a kid. This isn't, you know, a 16 year old freshman where he's driving himself to practice, where he's, you know, this kid looks like he's still a kid. And you think about the great program that Weston's had over the last decade and the players that have come there, including his older brother, uh, Elijah, he's the first freshman starter that Weston has had, you know, in, in some time, if maybe ever. And talking to Anthony Newman, the former duck who coaches at, at Westland high school and John Eagle, uh, Damon Griffin, who also played at Oregon and is at Westland after being a central Catholic. I mean, this spring, they couldn't like hide the giddiness that they had <laughs> about the potential of four years of Josiah Molden. And when I saw him at a camp in April in Seattle, he was running with the top group and he was willing to go up against receivers that were three years older than him and wasn't hesitating, wasn't backing down, didn't win every rep, but he was running like, you know, he was a veteran. And, you know, one of the things that made Elijah so effective as a college player and now an NFL guy. And even, you know, before that, I remember watching Alex, his father play in college. I was in college at the same time as him. You know, Josiah is just so smart. His football IQ is off the charts and it's so rare for a 14 year old to have that and it's not a surprise that he had five six offers before he ever started a, a class in high school and as he just continues to develop and again we, you know that's kind of been a theme here when we're talking to these recruits is physical development but in his case it truly is a physical development because yeah. he's so young he's got the technique and, and the football acumen that when the the physical traits follow that this is a kid that's going to be probably starting as a true freshman in college. And I'm calling that shot right now, even though he's only a freshman in high school. Big names to know in this state. Not always this many names. 
Um, I've seen both in person. I've seen Molden at Oregon's. I think I've seen Molden twice now at camp circuit. He is everything Huff just said. He said it better than I could. It, it's this is a guy you're going to want to know about going down the line here. Um, we're going to wrap it here with just a question or two about USC Cal, what you saw there. These are Oregon's, ironically, next two opponents. Mm-hmm. Um, heck of a football game for starters. I mean, probably weren't expecting to be quite that. Um, what did you take away just like broadly from that game about both of those teams and and kind of how you think – I want to ask you how you think they match up with Oregon, but kind of where they are in their seasons. You know, I, I talked to Ryan Abraham in the press box, and I think one of the, the most beautiful things about Saturday is we got – the full Pac-12, Berkeley, Pac-12 officials, college football experience all in one afternoon. We had a protest in Berkeley right before kickoff <laughs> after the teams are announced or after the, the national anthems played. As they're getting run out of the field, there's a 20-minute protest at midfield. So we check out the Berkeley box, okay? Then we have the just – I don't even I still don't know how to describe it – the controversy at the end of the first half where – it looks like the half is over, that USC is going to be out of time. Lincoln Riley calls a timeout. Cal's going into the locker room. They pause. The rest tell him to go back into the locker room. Then they come back out to run one untimed play, which was a kick. The kicker was practicing from the exact spot he was going to take it. So, you know, Justin Wilcox calls a timeout at the after halftime, but it was a second half, or a second quarter first half timeout. <laughs> and then the kicker misses it. So we have Pac-12 refereeing ineptitude. Then we have an allergy to defense by USC in that game in Jaden Ott running, you know, two plays. USC was up by 10 at one point, and then they were down by 14 because they couldn't stop anybody. Then you have, you know, the, the big balls of Wilcox in, in, in a weekend where they're in a time where we've seen this spring, or I guess we're in fall, aren't we? It's how long I've been on the road. We've seen teams <laughs> not take a two point conversion to play for the safety of getting the PAT to go into overtime. I think Justin Wilcox realized that they were spent. Without Jaden Knott for the majority of the fourth quarter, they shouldn't have been that close with USC to begin with. He did not want to extend the game. I love the call to go for two. Maybe the play call wasn't great, but the play itself was a great call, and they ultimately ended up losing by one. But you you look at the fact that he knew he needed to spark the team, and you know when he brought in Fernando Mendoza a couple weeks ago, that has sparked the Cal offense in ways that we really haven't seen under Justin Wilcox. And I think – you know, he, he's still a little bit uh, green behind the ears and wet behind the ears and, and still needs to just continue to, to, you know, make better reads and, you know, know when to, to tuck it and run and know when to hand it off, especially with Cal's running game. But, you know, Cal offense kind of fun to watch, you know, surprisingly, which is things we never thought we'd say under Justin Wilcox, whereas USC's offense has never been an issue. You know, the, the excitement there has always been like, how is Alex Grinch going to piss off an entire fan base and message board? And I mean, we were in that in like the second quarter coming off the Utah and Notre Dame losses. So, you know, two teams that, that could were able to score kind of at will and two defense that were allowing you to score at will, which is not a great recipe when you're playing a, a pretty balanced offense like Oregon has, but also a defense that, you know, came out with their head on fire last Saturday. I'm going to get you out on this one, Huff. Um, thank you so much again for your time. Mm-hmm. You mentioned the Cal offense. This is kind of the storyline that I think everybody around Oregon has kind of brought up this week is they just are better offensively. And, and you said, like, they scored 49 against USC. I think that's the most of Justin Wilkes, Wilcox sorry, uh, offense has scored in a Pac-12 game since he's been there. Um, what is working? You mentioned Mendoza. I think, I think Jade Knott is – I, I'm not going to put him on Bucky Irving's level because I think Bucky Irving is is a really really talented player. But mm-hmm. Jaden Knott's one of the best running backs in this conference without question. What is, is it just as simple as they have a couple of guys that work, or kind of what what stood out to you watching them hang 49 on USC on Saturday? I think it's kind of this like gunslinger mentality that Fernando Mendoza has. Now you know here's the other thing: they had four turnovers in that game. And they still scored 49 points. They had three of those turnovers were inside their own 30, which led to immediate USC scores. But that was 49 points the offensive way. None of those were defensive points. And those came when they left the, when they you know gave the ball to USC four different times. And that's what was so incredible. Like this is an offense that against Auburn, you know, could barely get first downs. And when they get a first down, it would it would putter out and I mean, granted, you know, USC's defense isn't great, but it's not like Auburn's been setting the world on fire this year either. And, you know, Cal couldn't do anything right against Auburn. 
offensively. Now you look at him, and I think it's just a, a matter of you, you're seeing it in Tucson right now too with Noah Fafita, where you know you had Jaden Delora. Yeah, he was a known quantity. We know what he's done at Washington State and at Arizona, but with Fafita, there's like this childlike naivety that comes with a, a you know a first and second year quarterback where they don't know any better that they're supposed to go out there and have fun and even you know it was fascinating sitting in the press conference after the game Mendoza had a huge smile on his face like almost like hey you know we're, we're just kind of teasing you we actually have some dudes in here that can that can you know get some points going offensively and you know for a guy I think who's making his third start uh, against a team like USC again not a great defense but it's still USC and you're, you know your Cal which is that offense has not been scaring anybody i think it's a matter of you know even when they lost jay not they were still able to move the ball and they've got a number of weapons at running back they've got you know isaiah fonse who was a transfer from montana state where he was a phenomenal fcs player they've got javian thomas from climates high school who's a true freshman actually scored the touchdown uh, to cut it to one so they have some you know, some kind of intriguing weapons there uh, and this is after they lost their best receiver from a year ago in j michael stewart event you know jeremiah hunter he did have that crucial fumble on the punt return but He's been key for them. Their tight ends are getting involved in the offense. And it just seems like Jake Spavadol has injected some life into that offense with the move to Fernando Mendoza. And so while Cal's probably not going to win out and they, they still got a couple of games left, I think Cal fans are excited by the fact that, you know what, they can get into the end zone on the offensive side of the ball. I think Oregon fans are excited to see a different Cal just a cow that you know, you're not going to win this one 20, 21 17. This no. year, you know, you're going to have to score a little bit more. I don't know if Cal's offense is going to do what it did last week. It probably won't. Oregon's defense is much better than USC's, but it's going to be fun. All right, Huff, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Um, what's going on next? You said you don't, you're not hitting the road anytime soon. Are you, you're going to be popping around to any other press boxes? Or are we going to see you up in Eugene at all? Oh, you, you may. I, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up that Snickers that I dropped about 30 minutes ago. That's all <laughs> I've been thinking about this entire time. No, uh, we got the district playoffs starting in Washington and Oregon, starting the state playoffs this week. So I'll be bouncing back and forth between Seattle and Portland for some games. I'll be back down in Oregon uh, for the state championships in Hillsboro Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, I'm covering, I believe I'm covering a, uh, University of Washington, Utah in two weeks mm. up in Seattle. Um, I've been to, gosh, seven different college football stadiums this year. Um, and, you know, it's been it's been fun. It's been, I, the last three weekends I was at a college game of some sort. And I finally have a weekend where I can just, you know, bring the double TVs into my TV room and have a couple games going. If we have to get to game seven of the World Series, I'll take that too. Might have to bust out a third, uh, a third screen. Because this will be probably the last weekend where, you know, I have a Saturday free uh, where I'm not at a game or, or covering a game or covering high school playoffs. So I'm going to enjoy that I don't have to drive around a lot. Um, but I am going to be a little bit sad that, you know, we're, we're getting to the November slate of the season. And it's always very depressing because that means we're closer to it. I know you're a college hoops guy, Eric. I know that yeah. you get excited about those Thanksgiving tournaments. And I do. I, I, I do like – one thing I will say – when that week of Thanksgiving, I love turning on TV on the West Coast at nine in the morning and they're somewhere in the Bahamas or, mm -hmm. you know, in Maui playing a nine o'clock game and you got something to watch all day. And that's why I love Tuesday football and, and Wednesday football. Like you get to about four o'clock. Hey, I got the little action on. You know, we, we had the sports equinox yesterday or on Monday. So that was exciting. But we're getting to that time change where it's like now it's just going to be cold and dreary and it's going to be like that for the next few months. So. You know, goodbye, fall football, hello, cold football. Well, enjoy your weekend at home. I and uh, and Brandon, thank you so much. He's Brandon Huffman. Thanks so much, man.